Revelation, in Revelation chapter 14, in verse 1 through verse 6, we find it speaks of the 140 and 4,000, right? And these people, they have no guile found in their mouth, they have overcome, etc. And this is who we want to be. We want to be a part of that number. Next, we found the first, the second, and the third angel's message that followed right after that. Now, after the third angel's message, which ends in verse 12, right? Two verses later, we see that Jesus returns. We see him on the clouds. Now, that picture is to have us understand something. It's to have us understand that after the third angel does its work, Christ is supposed to return. Because you find Christ on the cloud. When you go to Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7, there the Bible says, we, 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 we know this, it says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall, we shall wail before, because of him. Even so, amen. So that's showing the second coming of Jesus in, in, in Revelation 1 and verse 7. And that same picture is found in Revelation 14 and verse 14. And so that's to have us understand that, that, that after the third angel does its work, Christ is supposed to return. Has Christ returned? No. And so that is why there is a need for the fourth angel's movement. So now what we want to understand is how is it that Christ is supposed to return after the third angel, but he's not here. What went wrong? What happened? I want to paint the picture again to be sure that it's in all of our minds. Because even if it is in 95% of the people in here's mind, I care about that 5% as well. So notice this again. After the three angels do their work in Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 through verse 12, after they do their work, we find in verse 14 that Jesus returns. We see him on clouds, right? Let's read it. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 14. Revelation 14 and verse 14. It says, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Uh, who wears crowns? Kings. kings. So there he is, King of kings and Lord of lords. Doesn't the Bible say that every knee shall bow, and every tongue confess that he is Lord. So here we see Christ as Lord. He is as king. He has the crown. So this is, this is clearly supposed to be Christ coming back. What can we use to establish that? Revelation 1 and verse 7. Revelation 1 and verse 7. Behold, he comes. Revelation 1 and verse 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth. All right, so that's the picture right there. After the third angel does its work, Christ is supposed to return, but Christ has not yet returned. Why not? Why not? Hope deferred maketh the heart sick, right? Isn't that what Paul just showed us a little earlier? So we need to see, we want to see, why is it that Christ hasn't returned after the third angel's movement? You want to care, pay, pay careful attention to this, okay, because these things are calculated. And when you start seeing it, it's, it's so beautiful and wonderful to know that God would teach these things to babes like you and like me. So to be able to see this, what we have to look at are the seven churches. When you look at the seven churches, then you'll get a glimpse, a, 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 a bit, an understanding, a, 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 an understanding of why Christ hasn't returned after the third angel's movement. So I have this little, little picture over here which shows uh, 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 the, the, the seven churches and where they were located. But that's not exactly what's important. What's important is the spiritual nature of the thing. So the seven churches, where they come up is in Revelation chapter 1, 2, and 3. Okay, now we're not going to read it through because, again, my object is, is not to go through uh, so many of the details, but it's to zoom in for us to see exactly where we are. Okay, so this can be a, a very thorough, long uh, a series, just the seven churches, but I'm going to uh, uh, condense it just so that we can see where you and I are. The object right now is to understand why hasn't Christ returned since the work of the third angel's movement. And to understand that is to understand our work. Okay, so in Revelation chapter, so okay, so the first church, the first church, 
right? The first church, who knows the name of the first church? What's the name of the first church? Ephesus, that right. Ephesus is the first church. Ephesus means desirable. And one of the things with Ephesus is that Ephesus, uh, she lost her first love, right? She needed to go back to her first love. Ephesus began between 31 and a half AD to 100 AD. And I have it noted right over here. 31 and a half AD to 100 AD. 31 and a half AD is when Jesus Christ died, right? And Jesus Christ is the one who established the church with the apostles. So from 31 AD to 100 AD, that was the first church, Ephesus, okay? And it was right there around 99 AD and then 100 AD where um, uh, uh, I believe it was Nero. He was, he was killing the church. He was destroying it um, around that time. The next church is Smyrna, all right? It is Smyrna. You can see all of this, again, in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. You can read through that, and you can see all that. So Smyrna was from 100 A.D. to 313 A.D. Now zero in in Revelation chapter 2, and look at verse 10. It's speaking about Smyrna, and notice verse 10. I'm going to help us to see that this is a matter of historical fact. Revelation chapter 2, and look at in verse 10, it is speaking about Smyrna. Again, Smyrna is from 100 A.D. to 313 A.D. Look at verse 10 in Revelation in chapter 2. If we're there, let's say amen. Amen. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. Revelation 2 and verse 10, the Bible says, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation. How many days? Ten. Ye shall have tribulation ten days. Tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. I will give you a crown of life. So how many days was the tribulation? How many days was the tribulation? Ten days. days. Now remember, we just studied with Brother Paul. We just studied with with Brother Paul that in prophecy, a day equals a year. One day equals one year. Does somebody remember what the text was? What was the text that we went to in order to solidify that fact? Huh? Huh? Where? Numbers 14 and verse? And verse? If we have your notes, does it, so, and verse, is that what you wrote down? Verse 34. Numbers 14 and verse 34 shows us that a day is for a year. Okay? So this says that Smyrna will have tribulation for how many, year, for how many days? Revelation 2 and verse 10, for how many days? For 10 days. So a day for a year means for 10 years. So when you study, when you study in history, we said that Smyrna was between 100 AD to 313 AD. When you go and you look at what was going on in 303 AD, in 303 AD, there was a man named Diocletian. And Diocletian, he was doing a mass persecution of the people of God. And you know how long that was for? You know, can you imagine how long that that persecution was going for? Ten years. Even as the Bible says, tribulation for ten days, Diocletian was persecuting from 303 A.D. to 313 A.D. And so Smyrna, again, was 180 to 313 A.D. And the 10 days was from 303 A.D. to 313 A.D. Now next is the church called Pergamos. Next is the church called Pergamos. What is that? Hmm? Pardon me? Sorry, I can't hear you. Spell the word. Spell per- Right, it's in verse 12. It's in verse 12. Revelation 2 and verse 12, Pergamos. Yes, yes. P-E-R-G-A-M-O-S. All right. So Pergamos now is from 313 A.D. to 538 A.D. 313 to 538 A.D. Now, during the time of Pergamos, the church of God, 
the church of God was going through a time of compromise. They were compromising their faith. They were compromising their faith. And so that is where we find the springing up of the papacy. That is the time where we find the springing up of the papacy because the church in that time was compromising what it is that they believed in order to try to reach more people. They were diluting the truth as it is in Jesus in order to reach more people. And so that was the beginnings of the springing up of the papacy with Pergamos. And the next church after Pergamos is Tyre, 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 from 538 AD, from 538 AD to 1798 AD, to 1798 AD. And there you have the control, a majority control of the papacy and the church. Now, notice with me Revelation chapter 2 and verse 18 from there, from verse 18. Revelation chapter 2 from verse 18. Speaking to Tyre, Tyra. But what I want to do is I want to roll down my view to a certain portion related to Tyra Tyra. There it speaks about how she gave herself up to Jezebel, etc. But I want to get to verse 24. Are you there with me? Revelation chapter 2 and verse 24. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 24. Speaking to Tyra Tyra, notice what it says. It says, but unto you I say, and unto the rest of Tyra Tyra. That word rest means the remainder or the remnant. Okay. I say unto the rest or the remainder or to the remnant of Tyatira, as many as have not this doctrine and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put, I will put upon you none other burden but that which ye have already. Hold fast till I come. Hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. So, 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 so what's being told to the rest of Tyatira is very important. But notice it, that this message right from right there is speaking to the rest of Tyatira. And the rest of Tyatira is now going to move on to the following church. I want us to get that very important point. Because when you look at from Ephesus up to Tyatira, you find, a, and all the other churches, you find that something is repeated. Something is repeated. That which, what is being repeated? I'm, I want to show you exactly what's being repeated. Notice verse 29 of, verse, uh, of chapter 2. 29 of, of chapter 2. Every church hears that same thing. He says, he, he that heareth, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And so to every church that has been said. And so in every church there's always a remnant, there's always a remainder. And there's always a message that says, whoever has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. So the, rema the remainder of those who have kept the faith in Ephesus become the following church, which is Smyrna. The remainder of those from Smyrna who have accepted the message partook of Pergamos. The remainder of those who kept true to uh, the message to Pergamos became, came into Tyatira. The rest of Tyatira are those who moved on into Sardis. All right? So there's always a remainder, a rest that moves on to the following church. And we're looking at that and understanding that in the spiritual sense. Let's see what I have over here. Yes, Sardis, Sardis, Sardis. Sardis began, did I put the date over here? Not yet. I didn't put the date there on purpose just yet because I want us to see a full picture here. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 1. What does Revelation 3 and verse 1 say? And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he 
that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and are dead. Meaning, you have a form of godliness denying the power thereof. You have a name that you live, but really you are dead. So this church is spiritually dead. Spiritually dead. Let's go to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and we'll read verse 3 and verse 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 and verse 4. We want to understand what exactly does it mean to be spiritually dead. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, chapter 4. Verse 3 and verse 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. 2 Corinthians 4, here we are. And it says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So they are blinded. They don't have the gospel, the glorious gospel of Christ. And so that's what it means when it says you have, you have, you have, a, a, you have a name that you're living because the gospel is bringing us alive, but really you are dead. Let's look at another text that helps us. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 5. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 5. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 5. And we, just, and we quoted it a minute ago. We didn't say exactly where it came from. It's 2 Timothy 3 and verse 5. And there it says, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such turn away. From such turn away. So Sardis has a form of godliness, denying the power thereof. Now these notes are actually going to be quite helpful, so I'm going to read through it. If you see it, then you definitely want to jot it down, because we want to get an idea of when did Sardis begin, because that will help us understand various other things as we move along. When does Sardis begin? Inspiration, when reading in the book, The Great Controversy, chapter 17, um, it's, called, it's entitled Heralds of the Morning. You want to read that chapter because that chapter speaks about the second coming of Jesus Christ. It goes through the whole doctrine and this whole study of the second coming of Jesus Christ. It's a wonderful study, and it's a wonderful thing not to only read, but to study. And so that chapter, chapter 17, it goes through the second coming of Jesus, right? From page 299 to 304 in the Great Controversy, chapter 17, right? It's teaching of the second coming of Jesus. And then from page 304 to 305, it describes the Lisbon earthquake. It describes the Lisbon earthquake. Now, I'm explaining this for a reason. I'm actually going through the pages for a reason. Because when you, she was inspired by God. And when reading through and studying the order that she's saying what she's saying and the verses that she's putting in under inspiration, it's so that we can learn something. It's so that we can grasp the idea that she's showing. So from page 299 to 304, she's teaching the second coming of Christ. From page 304 to 305, that describes the Lisbon earthquake. Now, the Lisbon earthquake occurred Saturday, November 1st, 1755. That's when the Lisbon earthquake occurred. Saturday, November 1st, 1755. Now, as you continue reading the book and the pages, from page 306 to 308, it describes the dark day. It describes the dark day, which was May 19th, 1780. May 19th, 1780. Now, the Bible prophesied that there would be earthquakes before Christ returns. The Bible prophesied that there would be a dark day, that the moon would turn into blood, etc., and those prophecies have been fulfilled. Now, when you read on page 301 now, 309, pardon me, on page 309 now, Sister White says something very important. And I want us to notice that. 
This great controversy, page 309 and paragraph 1. And this is what she says. But as the spirit of humility, and she's describing the people of God during that time. But as the spirit of humility and devotion in the church had given place to pride and formalism, love for Christ and faith in his coming had grown cold, absorbed in worldliness and pleasure-seeking, professed people of God were blinded to the Savior's instructions concerning the signs of his appearing, the doctrine of the second coming. The second advent had been neglected. So again, they were teaching about the, the teaching of the second coming of Jesus Christ was going on around that time. It was, it was occurring during that time, but the people did not like it. They didn't appreciate it. They were neglecting it. They were holding on to it. They were neglecting it. That's what she's saying there on page 309. Now moving on, on page 309, now paragraph Three, she says, the condition of the church at this time is pointed out in the Savior's word in the Revelation. Thou hast a name that thou livest and are dead. Which church was told thou has a name that thou livest and are dead? Sardis. That's right. Now, so, so, so that's the condition of the church at this time, what time is this time? Well, as you're reading the book, right? That's why I was mentioning the pages. She was speaking about on page 299 to 304. She was speaking about the second coming of Jesus. She was speaking about the, 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 that, that doctrine. And then on page 304 to 305, there she speaks of the Lisbon earthquake. And the Lisbon earthquake was November 1st, 1755. And then a couple of years later, 1780 was the dark day. And here she's saying that the condition of the church at this time is being spoken about to Sardis. So Sardis, we would say, begins in 1755. 1755, because that was the condition of the church in that time, during what was going on then. Now, one studious student may be looking and saying, wait a minute, but you said Tyatira was from 538 AD to 1798. So how do you put Sardis like in there like that, right? Because remember, with Tyatira, who do you have oh, uh, I'm taking power? The papacy. Right? And when did the papacy receive the deadly wound? 1798. 1798. So there's a sort of a, what's the word that I want to use? There's sort of a coming out of Tyatira into Sardis that's going on. Okay? So we can't look at everything just like uh, uh, ch chopped up. Right? There's, there's a coming out of Tyatira. That rest of Tyatira was forming Sardis. All right, and 1798, we knew that the papacy received the deadly wound, so, so that's that. That's the ending completely. So it's a sort of a close of probation for anyone else in Tyra Tyra. So Tyra Tyra are, are unbelievers. They're complete unbelievers, all right? And Sardis were some of the believers, but they, but, but they, were, they, were, they were spiritually dead. They were spiritually dead. It calls for a lot of the taxing of the mind to really get and understand the, the, the principle behind it or the idea of how it all fits in. But the divine teacher will teach you as he's taught me and show me this because I'm like, how does this even make sense? How did it? But we know that the papacy received a deadly wound in 1798, right? Sardis, as we read in the spirit of prophecy, it is showing us that in 1755, the Lisbon earthquake happening, and in 1780, the dark day, and Sister White saying that this is the condition of the church in that time helps strengthen our confirmation that 1755 is surely the beginning of Sardis. As she says, you have a testimony that you live, but really you are dead. Really you are dead. So Sardis, 1755, and the question is, well, if it begins in 1755, then when will it end? When will it end? 
Oh, we have another statement here. Before I read that. Because God's working with his movements are ever the same. His working with the movements are ever the same. So now continue to zoom in your attention. Do not lose any focus. Continue to zoom in your attention here. Because this is important. Sardis was not accepting the second coming of Jesus Christ. The doctrine. They weren't liking it, right? They were losing it. They were neglecting it also, in fact, is what was really going on. They were neglecting it. So if they're neglecting it, what do you think God is going to do? Bring it back to their attention. He's going to look to bring it back to their attention because they need that. So, so to bring it back to their attention, God is going to have to send a messenger. Because God is faithful. So the Great Controversy, page 311 now. 311, paragraph 2. To prepare people to stand in the day of God, a great work of reformation was to be accomplished. God saw that many of his professed people were not building for eternity. And in his mercy, in his mercy, he was about to send a message of warning to arouse them from their stupor and lead them to make ready for the coming of the Lord. So God is about to get them ready for the coming of the Lord. Why? Well, because they weren't, they weren't receiving the message. They were neglecting it. So now God is going to look to get them ready. So what is God going to do? Well, he's going to send a messenger who is going to speak about the second coming of Jesus. What was that man's name? William Miller. William Miller. And William Miller was beginning his work in 1831. So the church of Sardis had an issue. They were neglecting their spiritual experience. They were neglecting the importance of preparing themselves for the second coming of Jesus. They were neglecting that. And so God, in his mercy, sent William Miller to teach and to prepare a people for the second coming of Jesus, to bring this to their understanding and to bring this to their attention. So we have Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis began 1755 and Sardis goes on until the end of the world. Sardis goes on until the end of the world. How is that so? Sardis goes on until the end of the world. Think about it. William Miller, he was preaching the second coming of Jesus, right? And then you had along with William Miller, you had William Miller and Josiah Litch and uh, 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 Charles Fitch, right? And those individuals that were, that were also preaching to come out of Babylon. Come out of Babylon, my people, right? The second angel's message. So you have the first angel represented by William Miller who was teaching the people about the second coming of Christ. You have the second angel who was teaching them to come out of Babylon. In other words, come out of Sardis. That's why Sardis goes on to the end because all those that remained in Sardis and didn't move into Philadelphia, all those that remained back in Sardis, they are in the synagogue of Satan. They're in the synagogue of Satan. Let's go into the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. Okay. So when you look at Revelation chapter 3, you're going to see that the, fir the first portion is speaking to Sardis. The first portion is speaking to Sardis. So the church in Sardis write these things. And I skip to verse 2. Be watchful and strengthen, and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief. And thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. We're going to study a little bit about that on, on Friday. Thou hast a, a, a few names even in Sardis which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. For the, he, he that overcometh the same shall be clothed in a white raiment, and, will not, and I will not blot out his name out of the book 
of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So, after Sardis, the next church that we find is Philadelphia. That's the following church that we find. That is the church called Philadelphia. In Great Controversy, page 429, and paragraph 2, it says, But clearer light came with the investigation of the sanctuary question. They, saw, they now saw that they were correct in believing that the 2300 days in 1844 marked an important crisis. So these people in Philadelphia that formed Philadelphia, right? They were studying the 2300 day prophecy. And they were seeing that Jesus is really going to come out and that's it's going to come back. And that's why we must leave Babylon. We must leave the errors and the false doctrines of the church and now move the, of that church and move into a higher experience. And that was the experience of Philadelphia, the church of Philadelphia. Right. So they left Sardis and everybody who remained in Sardis, meaning all those who didn't want to believe in the second coming of Christ, all those who didn't move on from uh, those false doctrines that they remained in, they remained and they are part of Babylon. They are part of Babylon. But those who move on, they're a part of the Church of Christ. Philadelphia at that time was presently the Church of Christ. 430 paragraph 1, I think this moves into it. Now was seen the application of those words of Christ in Revelation chapter 3, verse 7 and 8, addressed to the church at this very time. These things says he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. No man can shut it. If all, uh, we can skip that, that's fine. Now, as far as for the timing of Philadelphia now, the timing of Philadelphia, we may say the timing of Philadelphia was from 1844, particularly the, you could say the summer of 1840, or the, even the spring of 1844, the spring of 1844, because that's when they were preaching to come out of Babylon, and that's when they were thinking that Christ was going to come, so they suffered a first disappointment, and after that, they studied even more, and they saw he's actually going to come in the autumn, and Brother Paul is going to continue studying that with us. And Philadelphia goes on until the end, in the spiritual sense. Philadelphia goes on until the end, in the spiritual sense. Because the, ex the Philadelphian experience, the Philadelphian experience is the experience that we must all have. We must all have this Philadelphian experience. There was not one reproach to Philadelphia, not one. Everything that was said to Philadelphia was only good things. It was only good things that was said to Philadelphia. In fact, when you read of what's said to Philadelphia, Revelation chapter 3 from verse 2, it goes from verse 2 to verse 13. What's said to Philadelphia are good things. I know that works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, etc. I jump down to verse 9. Behold, I will, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, and do lie. Right? So when you're reading all these things about Philadelphia, verse 10, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon the world. And the question might be, well, this hour of temptation, what exactly is this hour of temptation that is spoken about here? Or what is the temptation that is spoken about here? Right? Because they're the temptation that came to the Philadelphians. It's a temptation. Now, just to, before I even talk about that temptation, let me just settle this. That we say that Philadelphia will go on to the end in the spiritual sense because we're speaking about that experience. Because there's a statement that I saw in the spirit of prophecy, it's over here now. It says, in every phase of your character building, you are to please God. This you may do, for Enoch pleased him, though living in a degenerate age. And there are Enochs in this our day. 
So there are Enoch's in this our day, according to the spirit of prophecy. And so Enoch, he had a, a, he had a testimony that he pleased God. He walked with God perfectly. All right. So in the, the Philadelphian experience is the experience of oneness with God. There's no reproach for the Philadelphian. And so we need to have the same type of a life, the same experience where there's no reproach. So that's what we mean when we say that the Philadelphian, Philadelphia goes on into the end. We're speaking about the experience. We're speaking about the experience. Now, so we have that. Philadelphia goes on unto the end in regards to the experience. But the next church, the final church, is Laodicea. Well, I shouldn't say it the way I said it. But the, the next church is Laodicea. I'll put it like that. The next church is Laodicea. Everything that we say is calculated. The next church is Laodicea. Now, again, the reason as to why we're doing this brief sweep of the seven churches is because we want to understand why is it that Christ hasn't returned since the third angel's movement. We're trying to see why is it that Christ hasn't returned since the third angel's movement. All right? So the next church here is the church called Laodicea. All right? Laodicea now... Begin, Laodicea began October 22nd, 1844. Okay, that's when Laodicea began. October 22nd, 1844. October 22nd, 1844, that is when Christ moved from the holy place into the most holy place. So that is the beginning of judgment. That is the beginning of judgment. Now Laodicea, does anyone know what Laodicea means? Anybody know what Laodicea means? People of judgment. Laodicea does not mean lukewarm. I did used to think that because I would always hear in church, Laodicea and lukewarm. So I'm like, okay, I guess Laodicea means lukewarm. Laodicea does not mean lukewarm. Laodicea means people of justice or people of the judgment. Okay, so the word is Laodicea. Laos means people and dikea means Judgment or justice or right or principle. I looked up the definition of dikia. It means justice or right or righteousness or a judicial hearing. That's what it means. Or judgment. If you're to judge, then that means you have discernment. Laodicea is not a bad name. Actually, it's a, very, it's a privilege. It's a rich name. But Laodicea has a reproach. But that name is actually a rich name. It's a, it's, it's a compliment, actually. People of judgment, if you have good judgment, that means you have good discernment. Because while they are the people that are being judged, but they're also the people that are judging as well. While they're the people that are being judged, they're also the people that are judging as well. Okay? So let us see, it's not a, it's not a bad name. It's actually... A, it's actually an honor name, a, 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 a noble name. The people of justice, the people of the judgment. Okay, that's Laodicea. They're the people who understand justice. In fact, they're the people who are supposed to understand justification by faith. That's Laodicea. Laodicea are the people who are supposed to understand justification by faith. The faith which works by love. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 6. It says, faith which works by love. And during that time of the investigative judgment, Laodicea understanding that faith which works by love, they have the experience of righteousness and are therefore able to vindicate the character of God. So Laodicea, they're the people who are designed to vindicate the character of God, to prove that God can be trusted, to show that God is just. They're the people of justice. And that's Laodicea. You see, Brother Paul said that, that names tell you your mission. So the name Laodicea shows the mission of Laodicea is to prove the justice of God. That's, that's what theodicy means. Theodicy is to prove the justice of God. That's Laodicea. That's their work. It's in their name. 
Lucifer, bearer of light. That was what he did. Gabriel, God is my might. God is my strength. That's what he did. He preached about the power, the strength of God. He preached the gospel. Even the everlasting gospel. He was in charge of all that. And so they are supposed to understand justification by faith. Laodicea. Oh, I wrote that note down too. But I want to show you something very interesting in the book of first in the book of Peter, Second Peter chapter one. In Second Peter chapter one, I had it up here because I wanted to go into it. Second Peter chapter one and verse five. There you find Peter's ladder. Remember Peter's ladder? And Peter's ladder, notice with me the order of things. God is a God of order. And Peter's ladder says, and besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness. Pause. Question. Brotherly kindness. What does Philadelphia mean? Brotherly love. You see, kindness is a love in action. Philadelphia, brotherly love. And then what is the final round? What is the next round after brotherly love, after Philadelphia, after brotherly kindness? What's the next one? Charity. And so after the Philadelphian experience, the highest experience is love, charity, the Laodicean experience, or what should have been the Laodicean experience. But we, found that the, but we find that the reproach to Laodicea is that Laodicea is lukewarm. Laodicea is supposed to be charity, pure love, pure love. The seventh church, completion, it's supposed to be, that's it. But we find a reproach to Laodicea, poor, blind, wretched, miserable, naked, and you don't even know it. We don't even know it. Go to the book of Colossians with me. Colossians chapter 2. I want you to see something. Colossians chapter 2, because this is something that actually saddened our brother Paul. Colossians chapter 2. In the book of Colossians in chapter 2, you're going to see that Paul is kind of sad. And he says something there in Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, reading from verse 1 through verse 3, there the apostle Paul says, For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. Have we seen Paul's face in the flesh? No. So this is, this is for us, and we are there to see it. That their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding of the acknowledgement of the mystery of God, and of the Father, and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So the issue here with Laodicea is that their hearts are not knit together in love. There is a lack of unity. There is a lack of selflessness, but an increase in selfishness. Laodicea is not having the experience of a love that they need to have. And Paul is saying right here that he wishes that their heart might their hearts might be comforted. In other, if your heart is not comforted, you don't have the comforter. Who's the comforter? So they are lacking the Holy Spirit, which is the indwelling of Jesus Christ. That's why we find that Christ is knocking at the door of the heart of Laodicea. Laodicea does not acknowledge the mystery of God. What is the mystery of God? Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the mystery of God. The mystery of God is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 26 and verse 27. Colossians 1 verse 26 and verse 27. Where it says, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. 
to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So the mystery of, of God is Christ in you, the hope of glory. But unfortunately, Laodicea doesn't comprehend the mystery of God, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. I want to bring that a little closer. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, another place which speaks about the mystery of God, which Laodicea does not comprehend as it ought to. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. And there it says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness, that God was manifest in the flesh. So, so, so is there an issue with our understanding in Laodicea of the fact that Christ came in our flesh? Yes. Oh, yes, there is. Maybe here we might accept and understand that, but as a whole, the issue in Laodicea of understanding in the Seventh-day Adventist movement of understanding that Christ partook of our fallen, sinful flesh. That's what he took. He didn't have it because he did anything. Christ never sinned. When Adam sinned, he, he, took, he, took, he had the sinful flesh. When he sinned, now he's overcome by the sinful flesh. And now he wanted to do good, and he could do good before, but after sinning, he was not able to. And actually, he didn't even want to, because he had a nature that pulled him against it. Christ took that nature on himself. He clothed his sinless divinity with our fallen, sinful humanity. He clothed himself with that. And so now he could feel the pull and our temptations. He could feel our struggles and our infirmities. He's very well aware and tenderly affected by what you and I go through. But while he was tempted in all points like as we are, he was yet without sin. He was tempted in all points like as we are. The lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Tempted in all those points, in every principle of what we were tempted in, he felt that, he knows it, and much more. Because he was not only tempted as man, he was tempted as God. Yes, the Bible says God cannot be tempted, amen? God cannot be tempted. And we find that God took on a form in order to be tempted. Have you ever been tempted to turn bread, to turn stones into bread? Christ was able to turn the stone into bread. But he said, not my will. Christ never pleased himself. Romans 15 and verse 3. It says, he never pleased himself. Do you live a life where you continuously please yourself? Christ never pleased himself. You ever heard of the swimmer called Michael Phelps? Michael Phelps is an excellent swimmer. He swims, he's a fish, basically. He swims excellent, wonderful. Imagine if you take Michael Phelps and you throw him in water and you say, Michael, don't move. You stay right there. Don't you move. And you start bringing much turbulence into the water. Much turbulence. You think he's going to be tempted to save himself? Oh, yes, because he's able. Because he's a, he's a professional swimmer. Multi, he has multiple gold medals. Now, if I throw you in water, you're immediately going to want to, if, if you don't know how to swim, you're immediately going to want to save yourself. But even then, you cannot. Michael Phelps actually has the ability. So his temptation is higher than yours. It's more difficult than yours. And more difficult than mine. Christ faced every single species of temptation and more that we can ever imagine. And he gives us that victory. And that's why we're not just conquerors, but we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus our Lord. But oh, that Laodicea would understand justification by faith. The mystery of godliness. Notice this statement here. 
because this is the people of righteousness. They're supposed to be the people of righteousness. And righteousness is love, a likeness to God, and God is love. It is conformity to the law of God. All thy commandments are righteousness. And love is the fulfilling of the law. Righteousness, the people of righteousness, righteousness is love. That's how we know we're talking about them. Righteousness is love, and love is the light and the life of God. The righteousness of God is embodied in Christ. We receive righteousness by receiving him. So Laodicea is supposed to have righteousness, supposed to have Christ. Christ is supposed to be on the inside. They're the people of judgment. They're the people of justice, of discernment. Uh, but, but Christ is on the outside. So do you think Christ wants to save his church? Absolutely. So the people who are supposed to understand this, this church is supposed to understand this. So now Laodicea, when does the testimony, when does the rebuke apply to Laodicea is the question now. Because Laodicea began October 22nd, 1844. But the testimony to the Laodiceans didn't begin then. It didn't begin then. Okay, because that people, they're supposed to be what we've been going through. The people who understand justification by faith and they have that experience. And that's who they're supposed to be. But then a reproach came to them. So the question is, when did the reproach come? Because they, that reproach shouldn't be there. I, I, I need us to understand, that reproach should not be there. Because then it, it doesn't work with their name. It doesn't, so, so, so when did that reproach apply to them? I was digging through the book and listening to people who study this and there's a statement in the Review and Herald it was written June 10th 1852 June 10th 1852 and notice what it says it says many who profess to be looking for the speedy coming of Christ are becoming conformed to this world and seek more earnestly the applause of those around them and the approbation around them than the approbation of God. So they rather hear from the world than hear from God. They are cold and formal, so formalism, like the nominal church, that they, that they but, pardon me, but they but a short time since separated from. The words addressed to the Laodicean church describes their present condition perfectly. Now, she says that this describes their present condition perfectly. So when she's saying their present condition, she wrote this in 1852. So in 1852, she's saying that the reproach to the church of the Laodiceans applies to them. It, de it, it, it describes their present condition perfectly. That was in 1852. Let us see, began in 1844, October 22nd, 1844, and here she's saying in 1852, so several years later, what is that, eight years later, she's saying that, yep, eight years later, she's saying that this describes their condition perfectly. So they've been slipping since 1844 and 1852, this applied to them. But there's another statement that I saw also in Testimony to the Church, Volume 1, on page 186. And there she says, I was shown that the testimony to the Laodiceans applies to God's people at the present time. At the present time. And that statement was written in 1859. Okay. So the Laodicean lukewarm condition and that reproach we can say from 1852, 1859, that is where this thing is becoming full-blown, it's becoming malign. Okay. So the church, unfortunately, is diseased. But I thank God that we have a great physician, and his name is Jesus. And so when, whenever God's people are sick and need help, God always sends them some help. Whenever, you remember, all right, so you remember with Sardis, 
What happened with Sardis? With Sardis, they, 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 were, they were neglecting the fact that Christ was going to return. They were neglecting the study of the second coming of Jesus. So he sent William Miller. And William Miller was teaching about the second coming of Jesus. Now those people needed to be strengthened and they needed confidence to know that we can't remain in our churches because they're not preaching the truth. They're not accepting and holding on to the truth. So they need uh, someone to teach them that, look, if someone is not remaining in the truth, then you must separate. You must move as God so leads. So you must leave Babylon. So you have individuals like Josiah Litch, like S.S. Snow, who are teaching, come out of Babylon. That church is Babylon because they're, they're rejecting the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so there was a call out of Babylon. So the first angel helped and did the work of calling out of Babylon. The second, uh, rather, of teaching the second coming of Jesus. The second angel came and was teaching about coming out of Babylon. The third angel helped because the third angel strengthened those individuals after they suffered the disappointment. They suffered the disappointment. But now they are lukewarm. I hope you guys followed what we were just saying. Let me show you a little visual. I think you'll appreciate a visual. Let me show you a visual before I look at this. Okay. William Miller, first angel, preaching the second coming of Jesus because they weren't uh, holding on to that. So God sends William Miller. Charles Fitch and S.S. S. Snow were teaching come out of Babylon because God realized he always knew, uh, that the people are going to need messengers to teach to come out of Babylon, right? Next is the third angel, Oral Corsier and Hiram Edson, who saw that Christ was moving from the holy place to the most holy place, right? The church needed uh, to see that as they suffered this disappointment, they need to be encouraged. So now the church is in a lukewarm state. The church that is supposed to understand justification by faith doesn't understand it. And so in order to help the church from their lukewarm condition, to heal them from that disease, God sends other messengers. God in his great mercy sends a most precious message to his people through elders Wagner and Jones. This message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior, the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. It presented justification through faith in the surety. So the church that was supposed to understand justification by faith, Laodicea, people of justice, people of righteousness, they became lukewarm. And so what did God have to do to restore them? He sends them that most precious message. A fourth angel. So you have Sardis. They received the first angel. You have Philadelphia. They received the second angel. You have Laodicea, the seventh church. They received the third angel. Does the Bible speak about another church after Laodicea? Because there is a fourth angel. We know that. So does the Bible show us a church after Laodicea? <laughs> oh, yes, it does. Oh, yes, it does. Oh, yes, it does. I'm trying to see how I want to go about showing you this. Daniel chapter 7. Write down Daniel chapter 7, verse 9 to verse 10. Daniel chapter 7, verse 9 to verse 10. I want to draw the picture for you. You're going to appreciate it. Daniel chapter 7, verse 9 and 10. Believe me, you will appreciate this. It says, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheel as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands, thousand, thousand ministered unto him, and ten thousands times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were open. So when you're in front of the throne of God, it is the time of judgment. When you're in front of the throne of God, it is the time of judgment. Next is Revelation chapter 11 and verse 19. 
Revelation chapter 11 and verse 19, the Bible says, And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in, the te in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and earthquake and great hail. So again, when you are in front of the throne of God, that is judgment. That is judgment. Mm, we can skip that. That's fine. That is judgment. Now turn your Bibles with me to the book of Revelation and chapter 14. Revelation 14, and notice with me verse 5. Revelation 14 and verse 5. Revelation 14 and verse 5. Now, Revelation 14 and verse 5, the Bible says, And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the, before the throne of God. So when you're in front of the throne of God, that's a time of judgment. Now, here we find that there is a people who are before the throne of God. Okay? Now, when you're in front of the throne of God, that is a time of judgment. Now, these people, they are not the people of judgment. Laodicea is the people of judgment. But these people are not the people of judgment. They're the people who have passed the judgment. They are the 140 and 4 these people have passed the judgment because the Bible says that in their mouth was found no guile. So they have been scrutinized. They have been investigated. And no guile was found in them. Just like Jesus, that in his mouth was no guile. They were just like Jesus. And so these people, when we look at this, the final church is not the church militant, but it is the church tri- is the 144,000. That's the final movement that gives the, fi that, that gives the final loud cry and forms the 144,000. And you and I have the privilege to be able to see these things and to partake of these things as well and to be a part of that number. In the book of Isaiah, you could write it down, I'll read it for you. We're, we're coming to a close. It's about to be one o'clock. We're coming to a close. It's, we're right here. But I want to make sure that you get this. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 33, verse 5 to verse 6, it says, The Lord is exalted, for he dwelleth on high. He hath filled Zion with judgment and righteousness, and wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times, and strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. Why did I read this? Because it says that the Lord is exalted, for he dwelt on high, and he hath filled Zion with judgment and righteousness. Who is on Zion? According to Revelation chapter 14 and verse 1. The Lamb and the 140 and 4,000. So this is speaking about them. They are on Mount Zion with the Lamb. They are that final church. They are that final church. In the book Upward Look, page 315, in paragraph 5, it says that God has a church. God has a church. It is not the great cathedrals, neither is it the national establishment, neither is it the various denominations. Somebody says, oh, I'm a seminary Adventist, so I'm in the final church. You better think again. Oh, I'm in this reform movement, so I'm in the final. Think again. This is the book, The Upward Look, page 315 in paragraph 5. God has a church. God has a church. It is not the great cathedrals. Neither is it the national establishment. Neither is it the various denominations. That is not the church. But she goes on to say, it is the people who love God and keep his commandments. Where two or three are gathered in my name. Together 
I am in the midst of them. Where Christ is even among the humble few. Thank God for the humble few. This is Christ's church for the presence of the high and holy one who inhabiteth eternity can alone constitute the church. Last statement right here from the Review and Herald, February 10th, 1891. This is paragraph six. This is so important. It says, we are not saved as a sect. That is not how we are saved. No denomination name has any virtue in bringing us into favor with God. We are saved individually as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And by grace ye are saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. We may have our names recorded on the books of the most spiritual of the churches, and yet we may not belong to Christ, and our names may not be written in the Lamb's book of life. My brothers and sisters, I want my name to be written in the Lamb's book of life. We are Laodiceans, that is our condition. But we need not remain there because we see what God is trying to do. We see that right now, the eclipse is over. It is for us to choose and we have the right to declare that the eclipse is over. And therefore, with that being so, what that means is that we are choosing to move on from the Laodicean condition into the condition of the church triumphant, the 140 and 4,000. We are choosing to be in that number. More importantly, we are choosing for the will of the living God so that we can follow the Lamb whithersoever He goes. You know that the statement in the book of Ministry of Healing it shows a bull, it talked about a picture, it shows a bull and that bull there is, uh, he is in between a, uh, a, a, a yoke and a butcher's uh, station, meaning either he is ready to be sacrificed or either to be worked for Christ. That is where we are right now. I don't know about you, but I want to work for Christ. I want to receive that fourth angel's message and I want to experience it so that I can be in that number. I want to be a part of that church. We are told and that is the final, this is the final slide, that the message given us by A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner is the message of God to the Laodicean church. And woe be unto anyone who is professing to believe the truth and yet does not reflect to others the God-given rays. And so it is for us to understand the value of those messages given by A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner, and when we take hold of it, oh, you want to see it again? Where is that? That is found in the 1888 materials, page 1052 and paragraph two. 1888 materials, page 1052 and paragraph two. And when we receive this message, when we take it on as our own and move on and grow into the knowledge of the glory of God in Christ, we form that number the 140 and 4,000. Is it literal or is it spiritual? I don't know, I don't mind for now. I know that I wanna be a part of that number. How about you? I need to be in that number. Jesus did not give us all these most precious truths for nothing. Jesus wants us to be in that number. So let us humbly kneel as we close that the Lord may give us the strength to move on from Laodicea to be the 140 and 4,000. Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you for this study, which shows us why you haven't returned since the third angel's movement. Now that we understand, as we've seen in history, that every time your people were struggling with something, you would send to them a messenger. With the first, the second, and the third angels. And then Laodicea needed a most precious message. 
and you sent it to them. Guyana needed a message. And you've had it with them. But in your great mercy, you saw it fit to send them even more through a school of the prophets. And in your foreknowledge, you saw that you would not just give a little, you would give even more with even an upcoming camp meeting. Lord, we don't believe that these are cunningly devised fables. We don't believe that these are coincidences, what's going on in this place. From your great and calm eternity, you have ordained that which your providence deemed best. Lord, that we may take hold of this gospel truth, that we may form that number that pass the judgment, that we might follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth, that we might find ourselves on the Mount Zion with Jesus when he comes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.